explain this field now of funnel geography to you. What I'd like to do in my lecture this morning is to give a broad overview of funnel geography. Uh, the discipline, as I'm sure you're aware, is concerned with the geographical distributions of genealogical lineages, especially within and among closely related species. But a broader definition can extend the uh, concern to deeper phylogeny as well. But in any event, however it's defined, the field of phylogeography is explicitly concerned with uh, time and space the same two axes that Albert Einstein was interested in physics, but now we're interested in space and time as our axes of interest in a bio biological context. And so, uh, phylogeography studies the spatial distributions of genealogical lineages as affected by all sorts of uh, <coughs> phenomena, such as dispersal and vicariance and other evolutionary phenomena. Now, space itself is often a two-dimensional axis, so one can often project uh, gene phylogenies or gene genealogies onto a two-dimensional spatial uh, representation. Now, historically speaking, the field of uh, phylogeography is very much intimately connected to studies of mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is just a beautiful, wonderful little molecule in animals for phylogeographic research. Not that phylogeography is confined to this molecule, but you have to appreciate that the field very much grew out of studies uh, focused on this superb little uh, piece of DNA that is housed in the cellular cytoplasm. Now in animals, mitochondrial DNA is about 16 to 20 kilobase pairs in length in most species. From a functional point of view, it consists typically of 37 genes. There's 22 transfer RNA molecules, two ribosomal RNAs, and 13 uh, genes that specify polypeptide subunits that are involved in electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. From an evolutionary perspective, however, one can think of mitochondrial DNA as a single supergene because all of the uh, nucleotides within it are tightly linked to one another. Mitochondrial DNA, as we'll see, is transmitted for the most part without recombination, such that from a phylogenetic or genealogical perspective, this is one piece, one, one gene, one genealogical uh, bit of um, the history of a particular species. Now what I want to do in the talk today is, um, as I said, give you an overview of uh, the field of phylogeography. Part of this will be historical. Uh, part will, it will all be conceptual. I'm not going to dwell extensively on data sets per se, but rather what I'd like to convey is what I think are about 22 of the major insights uh, that have come out of phylogeographic research. And I would argue that virtually all of these insights uh, that I'll describe were not a uh, part of the thinking of evolutionary biologists prior to the phylogeographic revolution, which began about 20 years ago, 20 to 30 years ago. So these are new ideas. I think they have, uh, in effect, revolutionized uh, the field of population genetics and evolutionary biology. And I'm going to try to make that case today by going through these 22 conceptual points. That gives me about two minutes per point. And I really could spend about an hour on any one of them, so this will be very much a summary. If you don't learn anything from the talk today, I think that would be wonderful, because it would mean that the fall of geographic revolution has been successful, that, that most of these ideas are now fully incorporated into most of your thinking and into most of the thinking of the field. Uh, that, uh, but again, I would argue that that is a very different perception of the world from what we had as population geneticists when I was in graduate school uh, nearly 40 years ago. Okay, so we're going to go through these one at a time, and I'll just say a few words about each. The first point uh, is that cytoplasmic genomes add a new hierarchical level to population genetic analysis. And here I'm referring to the fact that unlike nuclear genes, uh, Mitochondria occur in large numbers of copies per cell. Now this is true both of somatic cells and germline cells, um, such that what we really have are populations of molecules within populations of cells, within populations of organisms. And this adds a whole new hierarchical level to population genetic analysis that simply never came up in the uh, pre-mitochondrial era of studying nuclear genes. Um, in fact, a zygote, for example, is extremely rich in mitochondrial numbers. There may be tens or even hundreds of thousands of mitochondrial DNA 
uh, molecules within a particular uh, zygote, and the same is true of a mature oocyte from which that zygote derives. Uh, so to really understand mitochondrial evolution in its entirety, one has to be concerned not only with population level features, but also with intralineage uh, 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 phenomena, in particular in the germline going from one generation to the next. Now, um, this has spawned a whole sort of new subfield of population genetics dealing with the intracellular dynamics of mitochondrial molecules. I'm not going to go into that field, but suffice it to say that we now think there are probably uh, extreme bottlenecks in um, mitochondrial numbers in intermediate germ cell generations, such that um, despite the fact that a mature oocyte is very rich in mitochondria, those stem from far fewer precursor molecules. What all of this means is that the evolutionary transitions from, from one homoplasmic state to another is often quite rapid, such that despite the, the conceptual interest that we have to have in this intracellular dynamics, from a broader perspective, it really isn't a complication because most individuals, it turns out, empirically are homoplasmic or effectively so, meaning that each carries a specifiable mitochondrial genotype. Almost all of the variance, in other words, in, in genotypic information is distributed among individuals rather than within them. So these evolutionary transitions are quite rapid and we can, for it, all practical purposes, uh, kind of neglect that when we're talking about higher levels of the hierarchy. But nonetheless, this is an important realization. And in fact, I like to think about nuclear genes now in a new light. Um, and that is that the whole basis of Mendelian genetics, in effect, stems from the uh, way of, from the reality that n nuclear genes, each, each nuclear gene is passed in one copy through a gamete and ends up in two copies in a zygote in a diploid organism from which it derives. One could think of that as a sort of extreme bottleneck for nuclear genes. It's a different perspective on where Mendelian genetic principles come from for the nuclear gene, but it's come from studies of mitochondrial DNA, ironically. Another uh, unorthodox perspective on evolution that came about very early was the realization that even functionally conserved DNA can sometimes evolve extremely rapidly. Now, any molecular evolutionist in the 1960s or 70s would have predicted before the empirical data came in that mitochondrial DNA should be one of the most slowly evolving pieces of DNA on Earth. And that would be because of the conventional wisdom or paradigm that, structure, that, that functional conservation molecules that are functionally conserved should be structurally conserved during evolution. They have to be very slowly evolving when there are severe fun functional constraints on particular pieces of DNA. Mitochondrial DNA would seem to be the epitome of a molecule that is functionally conserved. You know, it's really centrally involved in organismal metabolism. There are no introns, there are no repetitive pieces of DNA for the most part. It's a streamlined molecule, no intergenic regions effectively. One would suppose that this should be slowly evolving. It was therefore a complete and total surprise when Wes Brown in 1979 and his colleagues published the first evidence that in fact mitochondrial DNA in animals evolves many fold faster than typical single copy nuclear DNA, maybe five to ten fold faster. And this is just a slide uh, that I won't go through, but from their original paper documenting the rapid pace of evolution of mitochondria. Uh, and there's lots of reasons for that that we, that we, we think we now partially at least understand. Um, I, won't, I won't go into all the reasons, but uh, that was a revelation, uh, suffice it to say, uh, to uh, appreciate that even this presumably functionally conserved piece of DNA could evolve so rapidly. Another conceptual revelation was the notion that some DNA sequences in sexual species show asexual or clonal uh, transmission. In the case of mitochondrial DNA, we're talking about matrilineal transmission. Here is a molecule that, for the most part, I realize there's a little bit of uh, a caveat applied to this, but for the most part, mitochondrial DNA is clonally or asexually transmitted without recombination from one generation to the next. And this is true even within what are otherwise sexually reproducing species. So we have this blessedly celibate piece of DNA that is getting transmitted through major lines even within uh, sexual species. And this has a host of wonderful uh, features that follow from that uh, realization. 